Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Welcome back to another episode of eLaborate Topics. We are your hosts, Tyrona Wilson, Mona Small, and Stephanie Whitehead. We are so excited about this opportunity to talk with you about all things medical laboratory. For those of you tuning in for the first time, eLaborate Topics is a weekly podcast where myself and my co-host bring to you topics related to laboratory and leadership to help you excel inside and outside of the laboratory. We are very excited about today's show. We have decided we have gotten into over 30 episodes of the show already, and we wanted to take some time out to introduce you to us. So this show is a very exciting show where we will get to know our co-host, Stephanie Whitehead. So all things uh, laboratory will be from the Stephanie Whitehead perspective today. So, Stephanie, the show's all about you, and I'm so excited to learn more and more and more about you. So, let's jump right in and tell the listeners about your laboratory journey and how did you get to where you are today so that they can learn more about you besides what they've been able to learn so far. Well, thank you, Taiwana. I'm excited to um, just open up a little bit more to our audience and let the listeners hear a little bit more about myself and my journey and um, some of the things that I've been doing or hope to do um, in the laboratory realm. So I've been in um, the laboratory medical science career for about 15 years. Um, my start to being a medical laboratory scientist uh, is, I mean, it was a, it's a kind of a funny story. So I have a, a brother. I have only one sibling. I have one brother. He's four years older than I am. And um, that four-year increment makes a difference because um, whenever we were in school, as I was entering into a new phase of school, he was exiting out of that phase. So when I was going into middle school, he was going out of middle school, going into high school. When I was going into high school, he was graduating high school, going to college. As I was going into college, he was graduating college, going to you know, graduate school. So um, while I was in middle school, he was in high school, I remember he had a project to do where he had to do a paper on a career that he wanted to, um, that he wanted to pursue when he was going to graduate. And I could only assume, just in my memory, that he had to read this out loud because he was practicing his public speaking on me as a little sister. And I remember listening to him at, um, as he did the paper, because he did the paper on being a clinical laboratory scientist, um, while I was in middle school thinking, like, that sounds like a really cool career that he wants to go into. He has since gone on to, you know, get a Ph.D. and uh, a doctorate in something completely completely different, and now he works as a dentist. But <laughs> I um, remembered that paper, so when I got to college and started to investigate career options, that was always in the back of my mind. And the more I looked into it, it just really seemed like a natural fit for my personality um, and what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so as I continued to kind of go through college and go through the college courses, while all my other friends were doing different things, like, you know, I had people who were doing political science and I had friends that were in accounting and finance and things like that. And when people would ask me what my major was and I would say medical technology, they would be like, what is that? And so it was always really peculiar because I always had to explain what my major was. But I completely enjoyed all of the classes. I enjoyed learning about the cellular functions of the body and, and what a clinical laboratory scientist does in the healthcare field. And so that was really like my introduction and my journey into the laboratory world. Um, right now, I, I currently, and people probably know this from looking at any of my social medias, but I live in San Antonio, Texas, and so I work at um, uh, one of the large healthcare systems here in San Antonio, Texas. It's the only uh, level one trauma center um, in San Antonio. And San Antonio is a pretty large city, so we stay pretty busy. So that's that's really how I got into the field and what I've been doing. 
Wow. <laughs> I'm really impressed by that story. A uh, few things to me that stood out was the fact that someone um, in, um, introduced clinical lab science to your brother at such a young age. And another thing is the fact that you were able to be introduced at an early age. And even though in college your um, friends didn't know what that was, I'm impressed that you were able to be introduced at that age. For me, I didn't know what that was. And even when I chose to go to college, I just thought, well, you know, I spoke to somebody who was in, um, was a med tech, and I said, that seems close enough to being a doctor. <laughs> so I didn't know much about clinical lab science, so I'm really impressed with that story. Um, so for you, Stephanie, what is it, what's your favorite part of being a clinical lab professional? Um, for me, well, it, and it hasn't been so much in 2020, but um, it used to be the behind the scenes part because I'm, uh, you know, you really couldn't tell from my personality, um, but I actually am an introvert. Um, if you, I don't know if any of our listeners have ever taken the introvert extrovert test, but um, I actually am an introvert with extrovert tendencies. Um, so I like the behind the scene part. Uh, you know, I've never been the type to kind of just want to stand out in front. Um, and from a very early age, I really liked math, science, technology, um, but I also liked helping people. You know, I was very compassionate and empathetic towards helping people. And so I knew I wanted, because of uh, the compassion I had and, you know, the desire to help people, I knew I wanted to do something in the healthcare field, but I wasn't necessarily like the type to be a doctor or a nurse and to have that direct patient um, care and patient interaction. And so uh, the medical laboratory science field just was a natural fit. Um, I also enjoyed, as I was going through um, my courses, and I'm from Mississippi, so I went, I got my uh, degree at the university Southern Mississippi, and the professors um, in the College of Health would always emphasize that in healthcare, healthcare was a team, and that, you know, the doctors and nurses really relied on um, the team of ancillary professionals, whether it be pharmacy, radiology, physical therapy, lab, to help them in the overall care for the patient. So I really liked how they, you know, really kind of anchored, you know, healthcare as a team, and even though you weren't a doctor or a nurse, you were still, you know, a part of the entire healthcare wheel. And so I, I think um, to me, you know, like I said, in 2020, we've, we've all had to adjust just due to the pandemic and everything that's been going on, um, and we've all had to kind of step outside of our comfort zones and, and be more in the forefront. But I think, you know, really being a part of the healthcare team in a different way, the behind the scenes, you know, helping the doctors get what they need for the patient is really my favorite part. What about you guys? What's your favorite part of being a medical laboratory scientist? I'd absolutely love being able to know that what I do each and every day impacts our patients. And whether we get the credit or not, it's the important part of knowing that we are making a difference in their lives. As you mentioned, with COVID, I mean, right now it is huge uh, with COVID and our impact on what's happening in the world as we know it today. So I love that part. I love the mentoring and training of the uh, new techs coming along. I think it's inspiring to see the many avenues that people can go uh, in this field having a degree in medical laboratory science. So those are just a few things. You know, I'm all about leadership, but I also enjoy the impact that we make uh, for the lives of the patients in the communities that we touch. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So for me, um, Stephanie, I like the, the team idea, and I stress that a lot in terms of how we contribute to the whole healthcare team. And we contribute in such a big way, although we are behind the scenes. And, they, you know, it's like for diagnosis depends so much on the lab. I was just in a meeting with other healthcare leaders, and a lot of them are looking at um, improvements in healthcare. And so many of the um, improvement projects involve the lab because we depend, mm -hmm. they, they depend so much 
on getting lab results or, you know, things for diagnosis, and a lot of times it's taken for granted. And I love the fact that we have such a big impact as part of the healthcare team, and that's an area that not only the rest of healthcare takes for granted, but sometimes we ourselves take that for granted. And that's why I advocate a lot um, by letting, you know, us, emphasize that we are an important part of the whole. That is I completely so, agree. So true. So, Stephanie, as we all know, leaders come from different backgrounds, the different strengths, and I learned something today. I did not know you were from Mississippi. So, you know, again, <laughs> I'm just excited that we are even having this deeper conversation because What some of the listeners may or may not know is that although we are co-hosts on this show, we have never physically met each other before. So that just is, this is just awesome. I've actually never thought about that. (laughs) We have never never physically met. And we cover a huge (laughs) landscape of the U.S. with you being in Texas and Lona being in the Maryland area and myself being in Ohio. We are really covering the globe. And it lets you know that uh, we are united as medical laboratory professionals. So with us coming from our different backgrounds and different strengths, what strengths do you feel are important to be successful as a leader in the laboratory and in the hospital? Um, so one, I think, um, obviously, um, collaborating with your peers and collaborating with other departments, um, knowing how to uh, really get outside of your own area as a leader and work uh, collaboratively with whoever whoever else is on the entire team. And so I think in, in one of our very early episodes, I interviewed um, a professional that used to work with me, her name was Cami Rapp. And we talk about how when she worked at the organization that I currently work at, she was our patient safety officer. And typically the patient safety, the hospital's patient safety officer and the laboratory don't typically interface. Um, But we found um, ways to cross paths so many times that, you know, I I really just started talking to her about some of the things that we were seeing in the laboratory um, that were either slowing us down, creating bottlenecks, creating us to have to do workarounds, and really trying to invoke her help on how she could um, engage the nursing team or our clinical team to re-educate or look for IT solutions, really ways to just fix that and improve the process for the laboratory. And um, that just really cultivated you know, conversation after conversation and project and process improvement after process improvement where we continuously worked on things. And really that was just because um, even though I didn't just look at it like, okay, you're the patient safety officer. I'm from the laboratory and we don't never need to talk. I looked at it like this is a person who could possibly help and how can we collaborate. And so I I would encourage anybody in leaders, leaders to step outside of their role. There's always a way that the lab can assist radiology, that pharmacy can assist respiratory therapy, and that everybody, everybody's world kind of intertwines at some point, and there's always something that you can improve upon. Um, some of my strengths that I really think have helped me along the way is a very type A, so prioritization and organization and time management, sticky notes, lists, checklists, checklists about my checklists, apps in my phone, um, I think have kind of kept me um, task oriented and kind of kept me um, uh, cognizant of what deadlines are coming up and how to do those. So I would definitely suggest that, you know, everybody's not type A like I am, but that you definitely find your own rhythm and flow of how you can um, continuously move through your day and make sure that you're hitting all of the things you need to hit and completing all the tasks you need to complete. Um, One thing I definitely had to learn was, especially being over a large operation, I'm the executive director of um, our health systems inpatient and outpatient services. So there's always a lot of projects. There's always a lot of tasks. There's always tasks that are immediate. And then there are those tasks where we're doing three- to five-year projections. And um, continuously being cognizant, even from day to day, things change in terms of the prioritization of things, that all projects can't be important at the same time. And that's something that I had to really 
um, learn and that I'm still really learning, you know, because I'm one of those people who, you know, if I have 10 things to do, I want all 10 things done right now. Um, But really, you know, not to overwork yourself, understanding that, you know, this job is a marathon, not a race, and so you have to pace yourself in order to get things done. And some things may just have to go to the parking lot while you focus on other things so that you can make sure that everything is done appropriately and with, you know, patient quality um, uh, in mind. And you also have to be cognizant of your team. You know, you can't put a million projects on your team. You'll overwork them. Um, And so you have to be cognizant of how much work they have in terms of normal operations and things like that so you don't overload them. Um, I I would, you know, uh, suggest to other leaders who are looking for things that they might want to strengthen is definitely, especially with 2020 being what it is, um, learning to be nimble um, or uh, understanding different ways that you can be nimble. Um, That's helped me a lot, flexibility and knowing how to quickly pivot from one direction to another. You can't be rigid and you can't be stuck on one idea because things have changed rapidly, especially, like I said, um, in this year of a pandemic. Um, And then just understanding ways to have transparent and honest and open communication. Um, Sometimes you don't need to speak. Sometimes you need to speak. Sometimes you need to listen um, and be the last to speak. And so just kind of understanding where you fall in those communication skills. One thing I think is different is difficult for laboratory, most laboratory people, because many laboratory people have um, this, a similar type of personality, but being an advocate for not only yourself and your, yourself, but your department. Um, so not to be afraid of uh, problems as they arise and being able to effectively communicate uh, what those problems are. Uh, when they do come out. Um, One of the things that I really had to learn was in my role, you know, um, to expect problems to come. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that has really helped me. One of the the biggest compliments that I get, and I don't really even – I never really understood why it was a compliment, but a lot of people will say, you know, when chaos arises or when a problem arises or when there's a huge patient event, people will always say, you know, Stephanie, you're so calm. In every meeting, you're so calm. You're always so calm when things happen. And um, I'm always so shocked by, you know, that remark because in my head I'm thinking, well, that's what you pay me to do. You don't, you don't pay me to be the one that's running around, like, with my head, you know, on fire and screaming and crying or getting emotional. You pay me to be the one that is going to process what, what just happened and think about, you know, what action we need to take and then implement the action. Um, so really just understanding what is your role in the organization um, and then moving from there. That's awesome. And I'm excited and happy that you talked about the self-advocacy part. And for those of you that are listening, if you didn't tune in to uh, one of our last episodes with Cedric LaFour, he talked a lot about being an advocate for yourself as well as being an advocate uh, for your department. And those the very things that Stephanie is saying about being an advocate for yourself and department is critical. Uh, but you are right. If you are a leader and you're able to maintain your calm, that is really a superpower, and a lot of people can't do it. So you said it so calmly and just so, uh, you know, I think that is a superpower. So kudos to you, my sister, and, and being able to maintain your calm under pressure, and I'm sure you and your teams have had a lot of high-energy, high-stress situations that have arose over this year. So I'm sure your team well, really and values sh- and appreciates that. I, I don't think we're, you know, and I think we're, we're pretty much like every other laboratory we've had to um, really adjust and recalculate and readjust based on COVID. But if you are a leader out there, I, you know, challenge you to think about how you do react in certain situations. And then when you think about that, think about how your team reacted. Because a lot of times, you know, your team's reaction will mirror your reaction. And so um, there are times where, you know, people will tell me a story or people will tell me what happened with a patient sample or I will sit in a meeting and I'll, and I'll hear, you know, um, projections or things that are going on with the laboratory. And internally, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? But, you know, I try not to project that because, you know, 
sometimes people feed off of your energy. Um, and, you know, it's an old adage, so I don't want to date, date myself, but sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. And so uh, even internally, if you don't have all the answers, or even internally, if you think, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? I, I try not to project that um, because I know a lot of times that as a leader, you know, the people that follow you are always looking at what you're doing, always looking at how you're reacting, and then sometimes they mirror that. And so if you think about your boss, and if something happens and your boss comes into your office and says, oh, my God, Tawana and Lona, Lona I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where we're you know, then as, as a person working for, as an employee, then you feel lost. If the leader doesn't know what's going on, what am I going to do, you know? Um, so we try to I, – I, that's really what I try to keep in mind is, is you know, keeping it calm, cool, and collected until um, – until we can find out what, what our appropriate direction is and an appropriate action to take. And then just understanding, like I said, problems are going to happen. That's why they have a CEO. That's why they have a CFO. That's why you have, you know, a vice president of quality in every hospital. You have those roles because you're employing people to handle the problems that will arise because you know problems will happen. And so if you come to work every day thinking it's going to be roses and sunshine and you know, we're all going to just frolic and there's going to be no phone calls and no angry doctors and all the QC is going to work and CAP's not going to show up, then, you know, you've kind of set yourself up for failure. If you come to work thinking, you know, uh, if, if a problem arises, which it might and probably will, I can handle it. Whatever it is, I can handle it. Um, then you kind of put yourself in the mindset to already be processing, okay, that's the problem that, that was going to happen today, and so how do I handle it? Wow. I love that, Stephanie. These are some real great leadership qualities. Um, When you take that um, responsibility to be the one to generate the positive energy, like I'm going to be the one to set the tone, and you're the one that's very conscious about emotional intelligence when you're in a meeting. How do you react? How do you respond? Even though it may be critical, you are very much aware of the emotion and you're very much aware of the energy that you should be um, conveying to your team. So I kudos to you, really great leadership qualities and especially that part about communication and when to speak and when not to speak. No wonder you're in an um, executive role. Um, very impressive. Another thing that I've always been impressed about you, and you mentioned that work that you do with other people outside of the lab in patient safety and quality um, one of the things that had turned me off from moving in that direction was the status quo that a lot of managers will take on, and they would manage and not lead. And so I was usually really turned off. In, off um, I, I wouldn't want to be a manager sitting around just following the rules that they say that, um, you know, making sure we're um, keeping the budget, don't give um, the staff opportunities. You know, you're basically not leading and managing, and we see a lot of that. But for you, what I admire is your leadership in that you move out of the lab. And even though you say you're an introvert, you find it necessary to collaborate and to look at opportunities to improve the lab on a whole. And it's not many lab leaders do some of those things or see that as important. Um, they're like, we just want to maintain staff. We just want to make sure we have trained staff and we have enough staff and we're following, you know, the steps and that's it. So we're not looking outward. We're just inward. So that's really impressive. And so I wonder, how do you, um, when you think of some of these goals as leaders, could you help us? What are some of the like things that you do to achieve these goals? Maybe mention two or three. Um, so two of the three of the things that I do um, when I'm when I'm setting a goal or trying to look at achieving a goal, 
um, thank you for all of the kind words you just said, by the way, um, is going back to your question, one, make sure you have goals. You know, make sure that you're constantly pushing yourself um, and striving to better yourself. And that comes with uh, a bit of self-awareness. You kind of always get to know where you are and where you want to be um, so you can continuously move yourself forward. But make sure that you always are continuously setting different goals for yourself that are obtainable and relevant to what you're doing. Um, you know, you don't, you don't ever want to get stagnant in your growth. You know, you, you always want to be pushing and striving to be the best, the best version of yourself, like Oprah would say, that you could be. Um, I would say surround yourself with people who are um, also goal-oriented, so it's helpful to surround yourself with people who are continuing to strive to make themselves better too and they have goals also because then um, you can feed off of that energy and then you guys can push each other and hold each other accountable. Um, so I've really enjoyed the connection that, you know, I've built with you ladies this year because seeing some of the things that you guys do, um, Tawana with your business and Mona with your business and your business being international now and Tawana with, you know, your, all the certifications and things that you're doing, it, it helps to continuously push me by seeing other people who are, you know, driven um, in their professional lives as well. Um, and then finally, I would say just stay grateful for the progress that you've made to that point because sometimes you can get really focused on where you want to go and the fact that you're not there and you don't realize, like, how far you've come. Um, so I've talked a little bit about COVID um, being super impactful on um, all laboratories, but particularly our laboratory um, also. And so just to dive into that a little bit more, um, like most laboratories, we've had to do a lot of pivoting from what our normal operations were um, when COVID hit. Um, so in our immunology laboratory, immunology laboratory was doing, you know, um, um, STD testing, HPV testing, things that weren't necessarily stat. And so the department was not staffed 24-7. And um, one of the biggest changes that we had to make was when COVID hit to shift towards 24-7 operations. And that meant adding on more staff, um, training new staff. Um, in the very early stages, January and February of the pandemic, before most of our large vendors had come out with um, either EUA-approved or FDA-approved reagents, we had developed our own CDC-modified method to test for COVID that was very manual as a manual extraction of, of the nucleic cells and the PCR reactions, but it was very manual, um, and it led to extreme turnaround times. But um, there was a lot of training that had to be done with the staff. There, had, there was a lot of training that had to be done with all of the staff. Um, eventually, when we were able to onboard the more automated processes, um, because of the size of our laboratory and because of our capacity, um, we quickly joined um, a group of nine other laboratories in the Texas Emergency Response Group. So there were these walk-up sites where they would collect, um, no matter what county you were in, the, you lived in San Antonio or a neighboring county, they would collect you from these walk-up sites or drive-through sites. And then all of those specimens uh, were triaged through an emergency management group that was staffed with, like, people from the Red Cross or people from the um, National Guard, and then these specimens were dished out, depending on your location, to Lubbock or San Antonio or Dallas or Austin, and we were one of the laboratories in that response group. So, like I said before, the ability to really just be nimble because the, the situation changed so rapidly. Um, one of the stories that I remember really poignantly was, you know, every day I came into work, probably January to March, it was um, something different. And, you know, we were working really long hours. We were here seven days a week, Saturdays and Sundays, um, just making sure that people knew um, what the protocols were, people had communication, that we could um, move space around. We were converting conference rooms to labs. Um, we, you know, we're working with plant engineering. We're working with every, plumbing, everybody to to make all of these things happen. And I remember um, just getting a call on my cell phone from a number that wasn't there, and they asked, you know, was I Stephanie Whitehead? And he said, yes. And he said, We're, um, I need to meet you. And it was another employee that happens to be a vice president in our hospital downstairs in the lobby. So I walked, I'm, I'm office on the third floor. And so I walked down to the lobby, and there's this large man uh, 
and he's driving like a big truck, a big Tahoe truck, and I see my vice president, and she said, oh, okay, he's here for us, and we get into the car. And so I don't know where we're going. Um, I don't know who this man is. <laughs> I just know that I'm now I'm riding in the car with one of our vice presidents. I'm texting. <laughs> I'm texting my husband. Like I'm, I got, I have an iPhone, so I'm like pinning my location to him. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> this man in this unmarked truck just picked us up. He didn't tell me where we're going. <laughs> he's not talking. And my husband, he's so. Um, You'd have to know him, but he's so sarcastic because he's like, did he give you candy? Like, did he offer you a puppy? Why would you get in the car with a stranger? And I was just like, I don't know. It just seemed like <laughs> the right thing to do. But we ended up um, driving, you know, a couple of blocks up the street from the hospital. And when we pulled up, there were all of these uh, National Guard military firemen, policemen, and they were setting up these tents. So it was one of the first tents that were being set up, and they had pulled me in because as they were implementing um, a drive-through site and trying to get the specimen, understand, you know, did we need a manual requisition? What kind of um, transportation did they need for the specimens? And so it was that type of nimbleness and that type of um, really just being ready to, to speak with people on the phone. I didn't know, but this person that I was writing with ended up being – the CEO of the Texas Emergency Management Response Group. Uh, and so uh, as I was talking, I was saying all of these things like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work because we need X, Y, and Z. And he looked at me and he said, I can call the governor. I'll get it for you now. And I'm looking at him like, what? Am, what? How did I – who are you? And how did you even know me? <laughs> you know, um, so it was, it was one of those things. You know, you had to just be ready for anything um, during that time coming in. Um, the communication, you know, all of the things that you learned, um, that I learned or that any leader learns as you're going through your leadership journey, um, effective communication, um, crucial conversations, you know, dealing with difficult people, um, having effective meetings, you know, I felt like, you know, this was the year where all of those things, I, I've actually pulled, I really feel like I've pulled on everything that I probably learned um, in my, you know, years of management, um, really right down to the fact of, you know, I, I only have 15 minutes with you. I need to have the most effective meeting possible, and we need to both walk away knowing what our tasks are so we can, you know, get through the rest of the day. Or, you know, when you're dealing with these type of things, there were so many external factors, um, people um, not knowing what was going to happen with the schools, and schools going to be open or closed, you know, could I get one meat at the grocery store? Could I get two meats? Or where was I going to get toilet paper and soap? And so there were so many external things that people inevitably brought to work. And working long hours, it could be very stressful. And really just understanding that people, people handle stress differently. So I had some employees that would, um, you know, make jokes, you know, because that was their way of, of relieving stress and um, getting through the day, and I had some employees that were crying uncontrollably um, and, you know, really just trying to understand how to support both personality types while being able to, to deal with my own stuff, stuff at home. Um, so I think, like I said, also team recognition, team appreciation, understanding, like, you know, all of the different ways that you can think outside of the box to recognize a team that had been working, you know, 12 to 16 hour days and seven days a week. So we did a lot of snack carts. We did a lot of emails. Um, we uh, would set, we would, I would take my phone down to the C-suite and just take a video of one of our hospital administrators or one of our nurse leaders or our CEO um, saying thank you to the lab and email that out to the laboratory, um, just any way we could to kind of keep kind of morale going. Um, and, you know, I say all of that to say, you know, these are some of the things that you, you have to do because you never know. Being a leader is not easy, and you never really know what tomorrow will bring. And so being able to think outside of the box, to me, really is, is one of the most crucial parts of being successful in your position. Wow, that was, wow, you had a lot that you had to go through this year. And you mentioned a lot of great points of just being ready. You didn't know who you were going to be meeting with at what time. You knew it was very stressful for the staff 
in regards to your immunology department, going from a first shift operation to a 24-7. Our, our team did that as well, and that's very stressful to setting up the drive-through. That's an adventure within itself. But kudos to you for going that extra mile and making sure that your team was still engaged. I like that you talked about having productive meetings because some teams, when things get hectic, they cut the meetings, which in turn, the staff and their teams are like, well, we don't have communication. And so it sounds like that you were very prepared uh, for everything that went on with COVID uh, and with everything that came your way. And uh, emerging leaders and those who are looking to transition uh, into advanced leadership roles, they often ask, how can I get some of these uh, skills that you are mentioning? You talked about effective communication and running engaging short productive meetings, like how can an emerging leader or somebody looking to transition from the bench to a leadership role, how can they find these opportunities? Like what do they look like? You know, is it from reading books? Is it webinars? How do they get this practical experience so that they too are ready, you know, if this comes around again? Um, so one, I would say, uh, going back to um, what I mentioned before, collaborations, because one of the great things about collaborating with people, especially outside of your specialty, is that you start to learn um, more things about their specialty. And so just through my connection with, for instance, Cami Rapp, who, we, who I mentioned earlier in this in this talk who was a patient safety officer, understanding her role, understanding how she got into her role and what her role did, um, I was able to, you know, relate that back to the laboratory um, profession and work with her to obtain a patient safety certification, which I might not have ever gotten had I not, you know, collaborated with her and made that connection. And so um, Understand that you can always find value in anybody that you meet, um, even if it's just understanding, you know, what their role is in the hospital. And perhaps at one, one time it might cross paths with your role in the hospital. Um, you know, there, there, are, there isn't any significant, insignificant, you know, positions, I think, here. We're all kind of here to, to drive towards that one specific goal of making sure that every patient has a great experience. And so even if I'm talking to the marketing department or the housekeeping department, it's important for me to understand what your role is in case something comes up in my area that I have a question on. And actually, um, you know, I manage a lot through um, creating relationships because I feel like if I create a relationship with you, it's much easier for me to pull on that relationship. You know, if I need something and if something goes wrong, if I have a relationship with you, it's, it's easier for you to just come and talk to me and for us to work that out, then you to fire off an email or, you know, um, call at me and scream. It, it's harder to call and yell at a person that you know on a personal level, if that makes sense. So I, uh, even with doctors, I try to manage a lot on personal relationships. If we, when we get new doctors or we get new chairs or service lines, I always want to introduce myself. Or I'll stop by and just say, how is it going how is your experience with the laboratory going? And is there anything that we can do to better serve you? Because I feel like if you, if I'm proactive in that way, then I'm less likely to field uh, complaints um, on the back end. I'd rather be proactive than responsive. Um, but um, collaborating with people, and then you'll learn other things that you may not learn specific to the laboratory. Um, specific to the laboratory, I think, you know, we've had several podcasts on being engaged in professional organizations and the power that comes um, with being engaged in your professional organization. So ASCP, ASCLS, all of our professional, AADB, ASHI, professional organizations offer, you know, a myriad of different courses and roles um, that you can get engaged in and learn more about yourself or learn more about how to be better leaders. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, not just ours, but <laughs> uh, I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts and TED Talks um, because I feel like, you know, when you have downtime, if you've got, you know, a 30-minute commute, you can, you can turn on a TED Talk um, and hear about um, other things that you want to improve on. Um, I mentioned a little bit before about the self-awareness part. 
And so continuously understanding what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, I think is really important to understand um, what you want to learn more about. So I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my weaknesses, and like I said, you, it comes with a lot of self-awareness to always evaluate what you feel like your strengths and weaknesses are. But I think one of my weaknesses has always been just the ability, it might be just because I'm an introvert, or I assume I'm an introvert, um, the ability to just strike up conversation. And so we've all been to conferences where you have that dinner and you're all sitting at the, the round table with the white tablecloth and, you know, you're sitting around a table with people you may or may not know. And that awkward time before you get your food, you know, just striking up conversation. Uh, I always felt like it's, it's difficult for me to, to uh, be the conversation starter. And so I listened to a lot of TED Talks on just how to start conversation or how to engage in conversation or how to, um, you know, have a continuous flow of conversation. Uh, and, you know, actually there's a, real, there's a lot of actually really good information about that. And it's, it's not actually hard <laughs> to do, um, but once you start learning more about um, the things that you feel like you have weaknesses on, you're able to go kind of go back and practice those things and create them as strengths. And now I feel like I'm a little bit more confident in, you know, seeing a person I've never met on an elevator or in a line and, you know, striking up a conversation and keeping the conversation going. It's really more about asking them questions. So if they mention, like, yo, I have two kids, and you may say, okay, what's your kid's name? And just continuously asking them questions. But um, that's because I felt like that was a weakness of mine, and I, I, and I sought out how to um, make it a strength. There are also, you know, you may want to just check with the organization you work with. You know, our, our organization is continuously putting out um, things about how to handle stress or um, how to, you know, that work-life balance. And even if you feel like, oh, that will be boring, you know, that's not anything that relates to me, take the class. You may you, – I've never taken a class where I haven't found at least one – one nugget of knowledge that I didn't know before that, you know, wouldn't be helpful to me moving forward. So well, what do you guys do? I mean, that's what I, what I think. Well, for me, I do a, I probably am addicted to learning, but I, there, there's just a variety of things that I do. I have my own coaches. I, I do courses. I pay out of pocket. I don't care um, for my job. So that's for me areas in which I think that is necessary to move me forward, then I'll seek out training in those areas. There are some, certain things that I may not put a lot of emphasis on when it comes to weakness. For one, you know, your strength, you're really good at organizing. I'm not very good at organizing. But I haven't put a lot of effort into trying to do that. If there are certain things that I can delegate, I will. But things that's really necessary to move me forward, I invest a lot on training. So it could be podcasts, it could be courses, it could be uh, my own co um, coaches. But I really invest a lot in myself. I agree as well. I mean, I have subscribed to being a lifelong learner, so whether it is the podcast, I actually have a, a pretty long commute, so I'm always listening to audio books or podcasts. I, I spend a lot of money uh, in personal development and growth, uh, and so that's one of the things that I always tell those that I mentor, don't be afraid to invest in yourself in order to get to the next level at some point, you're going to have to make an investment, whether that's an investment of your time or an investment of your money. And so I have coaches. I attend master classes. Uh, I participate in mastermind groups because while I think webinars and things of those natures are great, there is nothing like that actual interaction with an expert and with other people, other leaders, other people to get their experiences. So I really enjoy those education activities that's bi-directional, that it's not just somebody talking and I don't have an opportunity to ask questions because I want to know how can I apply those tips to my life. And the only way that I'm able to ask those questions is if I'm in a mentorship 
a relationship with somebody, if I'm in a room with somebody, if I'm on a virtual conference with somebody, if I'm in a workshop with somebody. So those are just things that I do, and, and I think or what's helped me as a leader is not just uh, subscribing to those activities in which you feel that may be helpful. And, again, this is something that uh, Cedric mentioned on his podcast. He said, you got the laboratory stuff. So it, you don't have to keep investing and investing in that. You have that knowledge. You need to invest in those things in which you may not have. So spend time meeting people in environments that is not comfortable for you. So those are just things that, that I do and, and things that I would tell uh, somebody. So I know, Stephanie, our time is almost coming to a close, but just had uh, one, like, fun question uh, to ask you, which is if you were to be a superhero, who would that be and why? You know, that, was, that is a very interesting question um, because, you know, uh, I, I think our audience knows us very well, and so I'm just going to be really transparent. There aren't a lot of African-American female superheroes. I mean, you've got Catwoman and all of the um, the really amazing women um, that played roles in Black Panther. Uh, I'm not exactly the most fit. I'm trying, I try to get like Taiwana because uh, I watch her videos when she's exercising, and then I think about it. I'm like, oh, she loves she's tired. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but, you know, I think superheroes come in different forms, and superheroes can be people that you just think are ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. And so one person that I've always admired um, just because of their philanthropy work, and I've always um, just in my life and through my sorority um, or our sorority uh, really been engaged in, like, the community service part and giving back and making sure that you're using – you know, all of the resources that we're given to invest and help other people who may not be as fortunate. So one person I've always um, followed and admired is Oprah Winfrey. Um, even, you know, when I was younger, I mean, I would I would be, like, in the third grade watching the Oprah show, like when I got home from school. Um, but really, to me, just the way that she's used uh, so much of her resources to impact the world globally, globally because she has that influence with the Angel Network and the school she's built in Africa, uh, all the people that she's helped in education and all of the uh, organizations that she's helped. Um, you know, if I could if I could be like her sidekick, I would. I don't know that I would want to actually be her because it seems like, you know, being a celebrity gets a lot of scrutinism. But, um, and I've got my own dose of small town celebrityism here, and it's, it's all I can take. So I would, I would be Oprah's sidekick. Wow, Stephanie, um, it was really an enjoyment to have this um, discussion with you. And as the listeners may notice, you know, we probably could go on and on and on, but we don't have much more time, so we have to wrap this fun up. So thank you so much, um, Stephanie, for sharing with us today, and thank you so much, listeners, for listening and continue to listen to other episodes of Elaborate Topics podcast. Yeah, of course, you can get um, other episodes on your favorite podcast pl- platform. And every Tuesday, we get a new episode. So um, continue to listen and share with um, others and download this um, podcast. And if you want, you can send us questions. Our email is um, elaborate topics at directimpactbroadcasting.com. And you can listen to this episode also on that same web- website, directimpactbroadcasting.com. Until you hear from us again, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics, where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.